Well, I'll, I'll, I'll start with, yeah. with it, and then I might put it down and forget all about it. Yes. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to you, and a very warm welcome to you this morning to the Chirara Music School here. Uh, my name is Bill Thompson. I think I've met many of you before, uh, so a warm welcome. And for some of you who are meeting me for the first time, a very special welcome. Uh, I'm delighted to have a computer who will be interpreting for me today and trying to make sense of some of the ideas that I put forward. Very welcome and very honored to have you again here in Bangkok. Thank you very much. That most of you understand English, I have just got a plan to talk about the Thank you very much. Okay, my tie is big <laughs> Okay, so um, again, it's a pleasure to, to be here and thank you to. Uh, our uh, hosts from the Chirara Music School here. The topic this morning, which uh, we're going to explore, is the period that we loosely call the Baroque period in music history. Most of us, I think, will have encountered uh, the composers from the Baroque period through our teaching and perhaps through our own performance studies. Some of the names of the composers come off the tongue very easily. Johann Sebastian Bach, Handel, Scarlatti, Kalimann, Vivaldi. There are so many who are known to us, perhaps because of certain pieces of music, which are famous pieces. But of course, there were hundreds of composers and there were thousands of hardworking musicians who performed the music of those composers during this fascinating period. And we sometimes read in books I mean, here's a very good example, if I may. Here's a book about Baroque music, style and performance by Roger Donington. We sometimes read about the period in books, and we, we have the idea that the, the Baroque period is from about 1600 to 1750. We have that kind of impression in our mind. But of course, like all periods and not all eras in music history or any history, uh, there was no specific day or year when musical style changed. You cannot say on the 1st of January 1600, it was the start of the Baroque period. You cannot say that because it didn't happen. It was a gradual process of change. And one of the reasons for change was the way society, society in Europe, was organized uh, rather differently than it is today. It was different politically, and it was different environmentally, and it was different in terms of the way people were educated, and the outlook of the people was very, very different than it is today, 400 years later. And so I think to understand the music of the Baroque period, or to understand the, the paintings of the Baroque period, or the architecture, we need to understand a bit about the people and the way the people thought about life and their philosophy and their outlook and how they were organized in the European countries. Just before this period, during the 16th century, during the 16th century, so the 1500s, we call the late Renaissance period 
in Europe. The Renaissance period was the period, roughly historical period, artistic period, during and uh, before the Baroque period. So during that time, life was very different indeed. And, you know, one of the things that was very noticeable when we look at the history compared with today is countries like France and Germany and Italy. Some, some of you might have been to these countries. Wonderful. I was in France three weeks ago. It was lovely. Uh, but these countries did not exist the way they exist today. They were made up of many, many small states. And each of those states had their own kings, or queens, or dukes, or princes. And so Italy was made up of about 11 different states. Italy, as we know the country Italy, did not become a federation of these states. It did not become a united country until the middle of the 19th century. But then, and Germany, as we think about modern day Germany, in my own lifetime, I have seen how East Germany and West Germany have become united. The political change has taken place in recent years. But when we go back hundreds of years, Germany was splintered into many small groups. And France also was made up of smaller states with dukes and uh, important people running those states. So you might be wondering, why is Bill giving us a history lesson? Why is Bill talking about this? You might be wondering. But actually, it's partly the reason why music flourished during the Renaissance and the Baroque periods. Because in these many small states, uh, the princes and the dukes and the kings and queens, they all were very competitive and they wanted to build the most beautiful palaces they wanted their palace to be bigger and more beautiful and they wanted to hang beautiful paintings in their palaces and of course they all wanted to have the best music being written for their musicians and being performed in their palaces and this is why uh, there was a great flourishing of music during the late Renaissance period and right into the Baroque period Okay, now this next bit is the one that tests computer because I'm going to give you lots of Italian names, all right? <laughs> so, so, I'm sorry in advance. <laughs> so, so if we take, for example, just the country that we know as Italy, at that time, in the late Renaissance period and in the Baroque period, there were four very important places for music making. And the first of those was Florence, the city of Florence, which is a city which, of course, uh, was a very rich city, it was a very cultured city, and there was one family for many generations which was the family that was the patron of the arts, a very rich family that built a palace, and the family was, was called the Medici, Medici family. 
ในเมืองเริ่มที่เมืองฟลอเรนเซประเทศอิตาลีนะครับฟลอเรนเซมีเป็นเป็นเป็นเมืองที่เริ่มเป็นเมืองที่สวยงามนะครับจนปัจจุบันนะครับมีคนทั้งรวยมากมายนะครับแล้วก็มีตระกูลตระกูลหนึ่งชื่อเมดิชีนะครับเดี๋ยวจะได้ขึ้นอันคนแรกนะครับที่มีเป็นเพลทอนเป็นผู้คนทำเป็นคนทั้งรวยมากที่ทำให้สังคมดนตรีเนี่ยฟื้นฟูขึ้นไปเมดิชีสันเดอร์เป็นคนที่ทำให้สังคมดนตรีเนี่ยฟื้นฟูขึ้นไปเมดิชี And they supported many musicians, and so Florence was one of the centers where music really flourished from the High Renaissance period into the Baroque period. And then Renaissance, yeah, that was the period of Renaissance and Baroque. Yeah, the the group of musicians, yeah, was a big, 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 Sforza family and the, the dukes of that family also were very supportive of music and painting and they actually had a lot of uh, composers who came and worked at their palace in Milan during that period. So Milan and Florence operated like independent countries, like little, you know, little states. So today we think of them as cities. In Italy, but at that time they were different, and they each attracted their own musicians and their own composers. The two is Milan, right? It's the same thing. Milan and Florence, yeah, it's like a big team. Big team. Ah, at the time, it's like a little country, little country. It's not like a big 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 country. It's a very beautiful city with lots of canals, just like Bangkok has many canals. <laughs> this city is called Venice, and Venice uh, is a very, very, very beautiful city, um, and has lots of palaces uh, and a great number of beautiful churches. And the person who was, the, if you like, the, the head of this city was called the Doge. And the Doge is a mixture of being the king or being the prince or being the duke. The Doge of Venice. These were the three most important Uh, places for music development, but there were others. There were others. The city of Verona and Mantua had another family called the Gonzaga. Gonzaga, G-O-N-Z-A-G-A, was also a very important family in Italy, and they lived in Mantua. นอกจากสามเมืองหลักนี้ก็ยังมีที่วิโอนานะครับไปเลยผมจำชื่อไม่ได้แล้วก็มีตระกูลที่ชื่อว่าบอนซาต้าเนี่ยนะครับที่ที่อยากประทานเป็นที่ฟังอีกอีกคนต่อไปฟังรู้ก็รู้กันมาด้วย And then in the city of Naples in Italy, modern day Italy, the city of Naples, they had their own king. They even had their own king, the king of Naples. แต่เมืองเนโปลเนี่ยนะครับก็ต้องมีกษัตริย์ปกครองเมืองตัวเองต่างๆด้วยครับ And the island of Sicily, Sicily, which is at the very south of Italy, it also had its own king. So Italy was made up of all these very small states. And this was very important for the development of the arts and music and culture and architecture because they were so competitive. They even all had their own armies. They had their own armies. You know, and they, they really um, try to compete against each other in many, many ways. And in music, they also they competed. They wanted to get the best musicians of the day. And this was quite uh, significant in the way music developed at that time. ก็เลยทั้งหมดที่ได้เป็นทีส่วนของดนตรีนะครับเพราะว่ามันมาจากลักษณะของการปกครองในแต่ละเมืองที่มีไปไหนที่ไหนสุด And where did their money come from? These people who were the 
princes and the dukes. Well, it was a, a great time of trade. Italy was a great trading nation with countries around the world, of course, uh, particularly China. At that time, there was a lot of trade. You will probably have read about Marco Polo, who was a great Italian who went to China and started the trade routes. And the main trade route was called the Silk Road, which goes from China all through the mountains, all the way through Central Europe and into Italy, ending up in Venice. It was the same in England. Our kings in England also wanted to have music to adorn their palace in London and to provide a sense of uh, them being very prosperous. And it was the same people uh, had the opportunity to paint for the wonderful paintings and compose music. So these musicians and these composers from the late Renaissance period into the Baroque period, all the names that we're going to talk about, these people all did music, not just to be a composer, but it was their work. It was their work. That's what they did. You know, the same way as some people run a business or some people work in a bank, some people are doctors. These people worked as servants. They worked as servants in the household of a, of a great and famous person. And then that person that we know, the chief of the family, he was doing work with people of high status. And that's why today we have people who are doing work with people of high status. And this important part of the society uh, maintained itself right into the classical period as well. And it was a long, long time before musicians were able to be independent of a patron. In, in some ways, Beethoven was the very first to break away from the idea of having a rich person as a patron. The King of England uh, employed lots of musicians in London, and the most famous of all was Handel. And the king liked to show everybody uh, how wealthy he was. The king liked to make a public appearance, and Handel had to compose music for outdoor entertainment. And there are two famous examples from the Baroque period when Handel composed music for the King of England, King George. And the first of these was to be a special occasion which was going to be held in a big park in London called Green Park. And this event was a celebration because the English and the French people had signed a peace treaty to say we will never have any more wars between England and France. So there was a signing of this peace treaty and so King George thought we should have a celebration. So he had a big public, a big public um, event in Green Park, and he asked Mr. Handel 
to compose music to be performed at this uh, celebration event. And it was so popular, this event was so incredibly popular, when I read people's diaries, when I look at the history and I read the diaries of the period, um, we discover that there was a great traffic jam. Now we know all about traffic jams in Bangkok. We know, we know about the best traffic jams in the world. But this was not a traffic jam with cars and taxis and school buses. This was a traffic jam with horses and coaches. And the traffic jam created a four hour, four hour delay. Four hour, it was a four hour. So the horse and coach, they stop. And before they can reach the, inside the park, it was four hours. That's even beats Bangkok, I think. <laughs> So it's true to say that uh, uh, in Thailand, uh, in Bangkok, you, you did not invent the traffic jam. It was not invented here. I think it was invented during the Baroque period. <laughs> <laughs> And so, the, the musicians who were going to play in Green Park, it was mostly brass and wind instruments and drums, because it needed to be loud to make a lot of sound in front of many thousands of people. And the king, of course, was there with all his family and all the important people looking very splendid. Uh, and so the, the music had to be powerful and they, have, they don't have this, no microphone, no electricity, no air conditioning, nothing. So the music had to be very powerful, so they used the loud, so horns, trumpets, bassoons, oboes. <laughs> And at the end of the celebration, at the end, there was to be a fireworks display, a big fireworks display, and at the end of the display, a picture, uh, an idea like the sun, the shining sun will be illuminated, and to show uh, the bright future for England and France. Uh, and so that was the plan, a fireworks display with a climax, so in the music, it's called the music for the royal fireworks. That's what we know it as today. And that's why it was written. So in the society of music in the Baroque period, Handel composed this music for his employer, King George, and it was for a social event, and that is one aspect of uh, the creativity which was available to composers. music for the Royal Fireworks in a celebration now, I, I do know that many of you here are pianists and you are piano teachers. And, and, and me too. Me too. That's my background. But I do always think to learn about this society and learn about the history, it helps us to understand the music a little more. And that's why I'm starting with this today. I believe it's very important to put it into a context.
หลายท่านที่นี้เป็นอาจารย์นะครับอาจารย์สอนเปียโนนะครับส่วนใหญ่คุณบิวก็เป็นอาจารย์สอนเปียโนนะครับเพราะฉะนั้นเนี่ยเราเข้าใจประวัติศาสตร์ได้ในเชิงลึกจะช่วยมากกับการอธิบายเองความเข้าใจดุลยเดชของผู้ประกอบการ And so from the music for the Royal Fireworks the most famous part has a French title it's called La Réjouissance and it means rejoicing it means you know we're we, we're all happy together we rejoice la réjouissance so you don't it's no different in Thai because it's a French word <laughs> มีเรื่องต้นด้วยคำเป็นไทยต้นภาษาฝรั่งเศสคำว่ายินดีนะครับก็คือ rejoicing นะครับนะครับชื่นชมยินดีความทุกอย่าง and so it was very cheerful I'm going to play it on the piano but it was originally played by about 84 instruments brass instruments and drums and you can hear right from the very beginning the music is a little bit c o n t r a p u n t a l a little bit c o n t r a p u n t a l but it's so cheerful that it has melodic ideas It's in binary form. It has two sections, and each section is repeated. And so there are many other pieces from the fireworks. That here is one quieter one, a little bit quieter, which would be have been played while the people were just relaxing, sitting on the park. This is called minuet. Minuet. And then we turn it up a bit, a small bit more, and then minuet.
many movements from the music for the Royal Fires or Fireworks. That's two of the movements, one of the joyful ones and one of the more like dance feel in that one. The other famous piece which Handel had to compose for King George was to be played on a boat. It was to be played on a boat on the river. Now this is quite interesting, I find this quite interesting when I think about the history of Thailand and I think about the history of England because the king had a set of boats which were called the royal barges, the royal barges. Now I also know in Thailand your royal family has royal barges because I have seen them uh, at Thonburi near the Royal uh, Naval Academy. I have seen them and they're beautiful and when they come out for a special occasion they're all painted beautifully golden. And King George's barge was like that too. And I remember uh, seeing on television uh, in Thailand when you have a coronation or some special, like the, the old king's birthday, or some special event, and we can see all the royal barges on the, on the river, uh, you know, which is very wonderful and very historical. Ah, so Kun Chani, my friend Kun Chani Tong is reminding me that next week, even in Thailand, you are having the coronation of the new king in Rama Ten. So, so this is still a tradition, you know, continuing. But of course, in England at that time, it was quite a new thing. And King George, he wanted to do something different. He was one of these people like new ideas, many new ideas. And so he asked us to handle, to compose music to be performed on the river, on the river, on the, on the boats. So when the king is going by and the king can wave to all the people in London, the music is playing. And that's called the music, which we now call the, what we call it, the, the water music. The water music is performed on the river, just like your um, royal uh, ceremony is on the river, on the barges. It happened then, way, way back in the 1700s. And even now, three, 300 years later, uh, people in England really like this music very much. And in schools, the school orchestras all like to play this music. And um, it's, it's very popular and famous music. And I will play you a little bit of the water music by Handel, the water music. That last piece is where about the Royal Fireworks, but this was the water music.
etc. Et it's a long piece. <laughs> so that is the music, some of the music for the royal, for the water, the water music by Handel written for King George. So even in England, the composers were writing music, the famous composers were writing music for the kings and queens and the important people. During the Baroque period, there was one very, very important king in Europe, and he was called King Louis the Fourteenth. King Louis the Fourteenth. So you are about to have your new king, this King Rama X, yeah, from the Chakri, the Chakri dynasty. And this is King Louis um, the Fourteenth. And the reason why he's very, very important is, yes, he was like the other kings, he wanted to build a big palace, and he did, and he wanted to have lots of artwork, and he did, and he wanted music, and he did, but he lived a long time, he was a king for 70 years, he was a king for a long period, he was a king during the change from the Renaissance period to the Baroque period. And so because he was the king for a long time, he was always bringing new ideas. And that's what made him a very important patron during the change from the Renaissance to the Baroque. And he lived in Paris, in France, King Louis XIV. ท่านฝรั่งเศสก็มีพระเจ้าลุยส์ที่สิบสี่นะครับซึ่งถือว่าเป็นพระมหากษัตริย์ที่มีอิทธิพลในฟีฟาสัตว์ครับเพราะพิ
ท่านประธานที่เราอาจจะรู้จักบ้างหรือไม่รู้จักมากนะครับแต่ว่าเป็นคนมีส่วนสำคัญที่อาจารย์ศาสตร์พระเจ้าหลุยส์ที่สี่เรียกเป็นเพื่อนในระดับนะแต่งเพลงเชิญเป็นเทนนิสเนี่ยให้กับเจ้าหลุยส์มากมายเขาชื่อลุยส์ลูรี่นะครับ L U L Y And the idea of an opera was a new kind of music making that started in Italy just at the beginning of the Baroque period. I think the first opera was composed about proper real opera around 1598, the first proper opera and in Italy. The idea of people singing and having instruments and telling a story. And at that time, the operas in Italy were all about the ancient Greek mythologies, uh, which have you know people dressing, looking like ancient Greeks, but they don't act, no acting. They just wear a costume and sing. No acting at that time. That was the very first operas. ส่วนใหญ่เรื่องราวเรื่องเกี่ยวกับกรีกโบราณนะครับความเชื่อของกรีกนักร้องก็จะแต่งชุดเป็นเหมือนเจ้าเจ้ากรีกโบราณแต่ว่าไม่แอคติ้งร้องอย่างเดียวนะครับนั่นก็เป็นเรื่องต้นของโบราณเขา And the very first important composer of operas from Italy was a man called Monteverdi and Monteverdi had lived half of his life in the Renaissance period and half of his life in the Baroque period so Monteverdi could see Changes. Uh, you could see new opportunities because people wanted different kinds of musical entertainment. And Monteverdi composed the first very important opera, and the opera is called Orfeo. O R F E O. Orfeo, and is regarded as the first important opera ever written. <laughs> ดนตรีในเพลงโอเปร่านะครับของอาจารย์แบงก์ก็มีบอยมอนเทเวรี่นะครับมอนเทเวรี่เนี่ยใช้ชีวิตครึ่งหนึ่งอยู่ในยุคเรนเซสซ์สิ่งครึ่งหนึ่งอยู่ในยุคบาโรกสิ่งเหล่านั้นคือเขาเห็นการเปลี่ยนแปลงจากดนตรีบูราจนมาดนตรีเทนนิสนะครับอันนี้คือสิ่งสำคัญแล้วก็แต่งโอเปร่ามีอาชีพโอฟิโอนะครับนะในยุคนั้น and in his very first opera we can learn when we study the musical score we can learn about the changes that were taking place but also there was one particular aspect which is for the singer where the singer is asked to sing the song sing the aria and then at the end he writes the words da capo al fine it's the first time it ever appears in the history of music and it tells the singer the singer and the orchestra everyone must go back to the beginning and play the first part again. And this was a musical structure which belongs to the Baroque period. Uh, it was a new idea, and there was a reason for it, and I'll explain in a moment. And so in the music, there was the first section. The singer would sing, la 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 la, and then the next section was in the minor key, la 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 la. And then at the end of that, it says, go back and do the first section again. But the reason is. When the singer returns and does the first part again, they have to sing it with ornaments. And ornaments, melodic ornaments, were very important in the Baroque period. And this was the beginning of using ornaments in the Baroque period in the da capo arias. <laughs> นักร้องใส่ออร์เนเมนต์ใส่รถประดับลงไปนะครับในการย้อนกลับเป็นเป็นไอเดียที่มาจากคุณบอลเซอร์แบดดี้เนี่ยนะครับดังนั้นออร์เนเมนต์ต่างๆที่ใส่ในการย้อนเพื่อทำให้โชว์นักร้องนะครับได้เป็นคุณสมบัติใหม่แล้วก็เลยกลายเป็นที่มาของกรุ๊ปเป็นคุณสมบัติของกรุ๊ป So this Italian idea of the opera and the da capo aria 
was something that Handel in London also liked to write music in this style. Handel wrote many, many, many da capo arias. And I'm going to give you an example in a moment. So the music is written for the singer and uh, the orchestra, and it's the first section and the second section, but the final section is not written. The final section just says, go back to the beginning until you see the word fine and then stop singing. And so the people who came to listen to the, uh, to the opera, they didn't come so much to listen to the music, they came to hear the singer because they wanted to see how clever how clever is the singer? Because it was the beginning of improvisation. The singer had to use the main idea, but decorate with ornaments. And so the singers became very, very important. More important than the composer, unfortunately. <laughs> And so I will give you an example of a dark couple aria. This is a song um, which is a romantic aria, and uh, the man is singing to the lady, Where, wherever you walk, the sun will shine, and wherever you walk, cool, the cool breeze will come, and the trees will look beautiful. It's like a very romantic song, it's called Wherever. Where uh, you walk, it means anywhere you walk, everything will be wonderful. It's a romantic da capo aria written by Handel, and I'll give you an example in a moment.
not a singer. I am not a singer, but I dare to do it, just purely to demonstrate the difference between the printed music and the So this is three sections, but also developing during this period because of the French, the Italian, and the English developments, we were beginning to get dance, dance rhythms coming into music. So move on to the next one, please. Yes, that's good. Okay, I'll go back one, please. They go forward, they go forward, it's okay. Okay, uh, go back. Okay, good. Thank you, thank you. We're beginning to get dance coming into music. And the rhythms of the dance being used as the basis of composition for keyboard. And interesting, many of these dances are still um, pieces of music that we find in our piano teaching today. And composers started to write music uh, using the dance characteristics, and there's two sections, so it's binary form, section one, section two, two, two parts to it, and you can hear the division that I'm playing for an example. For example, in the grade two examinations this year, you can find a little piece called Gig in the English style. Here is another jig by an English composer called Thomas Arm. Many of the Baroque composers composed suites, Bach and Handel and Purcell and Telemann. And composers in Bach, Telemann, Handel, Purcell, and Handel, composers in Baroque and suites. And usually the gig, the 6 8 one, the lively one, usually it's the very last dance in the set. And the pump G, yeah, and the one that comes with high, the big one. Here's a little bit of a sheet that's from the grade 8 examinations by Johann Sebastian Bach. <laughs> Thank you. 
เลยครับเรื่องความจริงเอ้ยเพราะเป็นจังหวะเร็วนะครับจ Usually in a in a in a classical in a baroque suite there are four principal dances four dances that always appear the first dance is always an allemand allemand The Allemand is a German dance, so that's quite interesting. The second dance is a Courant, and that is a French dance. Allemand is a dance of German, so the second dance is a Courant, a French and a French dance. And the third dance is a Sarabanda. A sarabanda is a slow, stately dance, and it's Spanish. And the final dance is a jig, and I've demonstrated some jigs. Some jigs are Italian in style, and some are English in style. But all the educated people during the Renaissance period. And the Baroque period, they all knew how to do these dances. It was part of their education to be able to perform on a, an instrument during the Renaissance or the Baroque, and to be able to take part in these very refined dances was a big part of education for the wealthy people and the highly educated people. It was a very much an important part of. Society. So once again, composers were needing to write music for the society. And usually, usually during this this period, uh, the suite, that's the collection of dances, would have allemand, courant, saraband, and then more dances. If a composer wanted to add them, there were other dances called optional. It was the option. He had the composer could add more. And then at the very very end we have the jig. But see, how many? Ah, they are not poor. They are very low end. To end the ceremony, the end of the day, some times there is option. There is a dance that you can choose from. But you have to end with the jig. It's the last one. It's the last one. And the optional dances included the minuet and the gavotte. Dance is an option. You have to choose the minuet and the gavotte. Here's a gavot by Bach. And of course, the harpsichord has a different sound. It has a different feel, and it all together um, is different from the piano in its qualities. Uh, harpsichord, take it in, 
เล่นเหมือนกันนะครับเล่นกับเกียนอยนะครับทั้งทัชทั้งการเล่นทั้งเสียงทั้งการรีโปรดิวซ์เอาต่างๆคนละแบบเกี่ยวกับ When we press the key on the piano, the fundamental mechanism inside allows a little hammer to strike the string, and then the hammer can release. And so it's a percussion instrument. It's percussive. But on a harpsichord, when we strike the key inside, there is no hammer. There is a little a, a stick of wood. With a small thing that, like a plectrum that we might use on a guitar, a little thing on the side, and as we press the key and the stick goes out, the little thing on the side plucks the string. And that's why we get a very immediate and uh, a very direct sound from the instrument. Now, support. Like that, we pick the key on the guitar. The pin, the instrument, doesn't have a hammer. The piano, right? The instrument doesn't have a hammer. เกี่ยวสายที่มีมันดีสายเป็นไม้เป็นเป็นอุปกรณ์อะไรอย่างพอกดปั๊บมันก็เป็นเกี่ยวสายนั้นปิ้งอย่างนั้นนะครับมันก่อให้เกิดเสียงที่คล้ายๆกับการเล่นกีตาร์นะครับ Because of that because of that simple difference between the harpsichord and the modern day piano uh, it was not possible on a harpsichord by touch to play loud or quiet the the, the tone would always be the same as as whether you Use your arm or just a little bit of touch. The sound will always be the same. So long as the string is pluck, 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 it's a short sound and 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 all very even in tone. And then, the touch of the harpsichord, it's like the piano. We can do it by touch. The harpsichord has a sound that is tied to it. When the piano is pinned, it's just a little bit higher. 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 So we could not produce crescendo or diminuendo. On the Baroque harpsichords, it was not possible to create a crescendo the way we can as a singer or a violinist. We can do a crescendo. Harpsichords cannot do a crescendo. And so, the harpsichord makers from the Baroque period they had a very good idea, and that was to make the instrument have two keyboards. So maybe we can move forward a little, please. Let me see the harpsichord one more. Yeah, you can see on the right side there are two baroque harpsichords. They contain two keyboards. And why we wonder? Well, inside there are two sets of strings. One set is a little bit stronger and brighter, and one set of strings is quieter. Not pretty keyboard. ไอ้ผลิตคลาสิกคอร์ดในสมัยนั้นนะครับก็เลยออกไอเดียว่าถ้าอย่างนั้นมันทำดังเบาไปได้ก็เลยทำเป็น2ชั้นเลยมีคีย์บอร์ด2ชั้นอันนึงเป็นเสียงดังอันนึงกดแล้วเกี่ยวเบาหน่อยก็ทำให้เกิดเสียงเบาก็เกิดเสียงดังเสียงเบาที่ต่างกันเป็นขั้นๆแบบนี้ so it was quite normal uh, for the harpsichordist the player uh, to be able to use both keyboards to get some tonal contrasts to get contrast And so usually the keyboard nearer, the close one at the bottom, was stronger. It had a stronger sound. And when the harpsichordist was playing a repeated section, they would move their hands up to the other keyboard, which would have a slightly more delicate sound. <laughs> ก็เวลาที่คนต้องการเล่นย้อนนะครับให้เสียงต่างกันไม่ได้กันชุ่มบนอันน่าเสียงต่างกันบนก็ทำให้เกิดในแบบที่เป็นขั้นบันไดนะ And it was also possible if you had maybe the bass part was very important the bass is important play the left hand on the bottom keyboard and play the right hand on the top keyboard and then if the treble was more important play the right hand on the bottom keyboard and the left hand on the top keyboard. So there was a bit of movement up and down across the instrument in order to create contrasts and more clarity of the musical textures. We 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 do wonder in the modern in the modern age when we're playing box music on the. Modern piano, you know how to interpret Bach's music. We we often wonder 
you know, what would Bach do? So we have to research uh, anything we can find that was written during this period, and also about what Bach's students said about him. Um, and it was, it's quite easy to find, because Johann Sebastian Bach had a big family, and many of his own children could play harpsichord. Many of his own children. And when his wife passed away, Bach got married for a second time, but his second wife cannot play. So he, he, wrote, he wrote a book of music for her, because all the boys, teenage boy, small boy, well, they can all play. But his new wife cannot play. So Bach thought, I will write a book of pieces for my wife. Her name is Anna Magdalena, and he wrote a book. And so we can learn a lot about how Bach uh, was, how he intended his music to be played by studying his music and studying diaries from the time. Uh, so that's 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 บาร์มีบาร์โจฮันเซอร์บัสเตนบาร์นะครับบาร์เนื่องจากบาร์เนี่ยมีลูกชายเยอะใช่ไหมครับเราภรรยาคนแรกเสียชีวิตแล้วเป็นครอบครัวแทนดนตรีภรรยาคนที่สองชื่ออาณาจักรเลนาเล่นดนตรีให้เป็นนะครับบาร์ก็เลยต้องเขียนเพลงเริ่มบันทึกเพลงทำไมสิ่งสำคัญก็คือว่าเราจะรู้ได้ยังไงดนตรีของบาร์ได้ยังไงเพราะบาร์เขียนไว้ทั้งเด็กของบาร์ด้วยลูกชายของบาร์เองด้วยก็เลยมีบันทึกหนังสือเล่มนี้สำคัญนะครับอาณาจักรเลนา and so when we play Bach on the modern piano there are different Uh, ways of interpreting his music. Some people have a very uh, strong idea about doing it one way, and other people feel, no, it's okay to do it this way. And the basic question is, do we make the piano sing? Should the piano have a beautiful singing sound? Or do we try to make it sound like a harpsichord? Because those are the main things that inform as to how I want to play my Bach. I like it to sing because I'm playing it on a modern piano. A beautiful, what's the point of buying a beautiful piano if you want to make it sound like a harpsichord? If you want to make it sound like a harpsichord, then get an electronic keyboard that can sound like a harpsichord. Uh, because I think Bach himself would have been happy. We know that Bach, on two occasions, he saw pianos, and the, and the first pianos he saw, he did not like. He said, I don't like this instrument, it's horrible. <laughs> But then, later in his life, he saw a more developed form of the piano, and he said, well, this is wonderful, because we can now make the music speak. So we know that Bach would have liked, we know that for a fact. So using the pedal, for example, I'm sure, and I, I feel very confident that Bach would have been happy to have had the pedal used in his music, because he, he did write about the developments of the piano in a very positive way. You know, he was a man who was always inventing new things. Bach, when we play the piano, we will sing in the school of Bach. 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 อาจารย์มันเป็นข้อโต้เถียงสมัยก่อนว่าเราจะเล่นเปียโนให้กลับเป็นเหมือนฮาร์ซิคอร์ดหรือจะเล่นเพลงฮาร์ซิคอร์ดให้มันพร้อมกับเปียโนดังนั้นอันนี้มันเป็นคําถามโลกแตกนะครับไม่มีใครตอบได้ทุกคนอาจารย์บิวแนะนำว่าอาจารย์ชอบเป็นคนซิงนิ่งเพราะเราซื้อเปียโนมาแล้วในยุคปัจจุบันเราอยู่ในยุคนี้ก็เล่นให้เพลงบาร์คลอดหน่อยก็ได้นะครับแต่ก็เชื่อว่าบาร์คในสมัยก่อนเนี่ยได้เจอเปียโน2ครั้งครั้งแรกบอกแม่เอาไม่ชอบแย่เลยแต่ครั้งที่สองไปเจอเปียโนที่ดีขึ้นพัฒนาขึ้นก็ชอบแต่คุณบิวเชื่อว่าถ้าบาร์คยังอยู่ในยุคที่มีเปียโนแล้วการใช้เพื่อเล่นเพลงบาร์คบาร์คจะชอบครับแอนด์ดูเพลงบาร์คมีสุขภาพ I will demonstrate in a moment very interesting during Bach's lifetime there was one big big major experiment which Bach was responsible for ช่วงชีวิตของบาร์มีสองการทดลองใหญ่ๆนะครับที่บาร์ And that is how we come to tune our instruments, the, our tuning system, the tuning system inside with all the strings. Until 1720, the harpsichords and all musical instruments were tuned slightly differently. First of all, The tuning was flatter than it is today, quite a lot flatter, nearly a semitone flatter. 
So little c would sound like b. ประมาณปี1720นะครับพวกเครื่องดนตรีคีย์บอร์ดทั้งหลายโดยเฉพาะสควอตจูนเสียงแบบนะครับถ้าเราเทียบปัจจุบันแทบจะแฟลตลงมาขึ้นเสียงเลยนะก็โดนเป็นตัวตัวตัวตัวปีน And if we had listened to the music at that time, if we could listen to it now, it would sound a bit strange to us because some keys sounded very out of tune. Some keys sounded in tune, but some keys sounded out of tune because of the way the notes were uh, the distance in tuning between the different notes of the scale. ถ้าเราฟังดนตรีเรคคอร์ดิ้งเก่าๆที่อัดโดยทางซีคอร์ดโบราณเนี่ยเรารู้สึกว่าอุ้ยมันแฟลตมาแล้วยังไม่พอบางโน้ตเป็นเพี้ยนไปเลยนะครับมันเป็นเอาท์ทูนนะเพราะว่ามันเกิดจากการจูนโดยใช้ขั้นคู่นะครับซึ่งก็ได้เป็นการจูนในระบบที่อาจารย์พูดต่อ Now we know as musicians that there are 12 major keys and 12 minor keys. We all learn that. Our students learn it. They have to play all the scales by grade five, don't they? They have to play every major and every minor. But until 1720. There were only total 15 keys that you could play in. Nobody composed music in the other keys. There were only 15 keys until 1720. And so we know that we have music in 12 major keys and 12 minor keys. But until then, nobody was composing music in B flat minor or E flat minor or G sharp minor. There were many keys that were never, never used because they sounded so out of tune. And so Bach had an idea. He had this idea of taking the octave from C up to B up to C and tuning the notes equally, the distance between them. Take the octave and divide it by 12 and make sure that the tuning is very mathematical and divided completely into 12 equal parts. And his reason was, he said, you can start on any note can be the tonic because the distance is going to be equal, and he called this system equal temperament, equal temperament. And everybody said, it will not work. It's a very bad idea, Mr. Bach, <laughs> we, uh, we think this is a very stupid idea. And he said, let, let, let me try it, I want to prove it. And so he did it, uh, and then I'll tell you what he did next. Oh. พอจะมีความรู้เรื่องว่าทำไมเราถึงมีสเกล12เสียงนะครับ12เมตร12ไมเนอร์แต่ในยุคเก่าเนี่ยก็แตกมีแค่15คีย์บวกลบไมเนอร์แล้วนะครับคีย์ประหลาดเช่นบีแฟลตไมเนอร์อีแฟลตไมเนอร์คีย์ยากๆที่พวกเราปวดหัวทั้งหลายไม่มีใครเขียนนะครับเพราะว่าเสื้อตัวตีมันเล่นไม่ได้นะครับในชุดว่าคีย์บอร์ดมันเล่นไม่ได้มันเพี้ยนไปหมดดังนั้นก็เลยบาร์บอกว่าไม่สิต้องทําได้สิเอาออกเทปมาจากโดนซีถึงซีแล้วก็แบกเป็นทีละครึ่งเสียงนะครับให้ได้ตามหลักการของระบบตัวเลขให้ได้ขึ้นเสียงไปให้ครบ12เสียงจนบาร์คิดระบบที่ชื่อว่า equal temperament ในการจูนเสียงหรือแบ่งเสียงให้ได้12เสียงเข้ากันแบ่งเป็น semi tone ต่างๆซึ่งคนในสมัยบอกว่าโอ้โหคอนโดนั้นทำไม่ได้แน่ๆแต่บาร์คบอกว่าต้องได้เสียง and so he thought he would take on the challenge because his friends said don't don't do it don't do it it's a waste of time but Bach no he said no I want to do this so he experimented and he tuned his own Bach always tuned his own harpsichord. Always tuned his own harpsichord. He didn't trust anybody to tune his own <laughs> And so he set about composing music in C major, C minor, C sharp major. C sharp minor, D major, D minor, E flat major, E flat minor. No one had ever written music in E flat minor or C sharp major ever. E major, D minor, and totally 24. And for every key, he composed a prelude and a fugue. And he composed this book of 24 preludes and fugues. Some of you have played some of them, I'm sure. ถ้าเราเป็นเพื่อบาร์เพื่อนบาร์ไปยุ่งได้ก็บอกเธออย่าเขียนเลยนะครับทำให้เราจนยากถึงทุกวันนี้นะครับ C major, C sharp major, C sharp major, C sharp minor, E flat. คีย์ประหลาดที่ไม่มีใครเขียนหลายบาร์คิดว่าเขียนได้เรื่องได้ And everybody was amazed. Everybody was really truly amazed at the genius 
of Bach's mind, his genius. And 20 years later, not one year later, but 20 years later, he composed another set of 24 preludes and fugues. So book one was in the 1720s, and book two was in the 1740s. So there's a big time distance between book one and book two. And in total, we call it the 48 preludes and fugues. Some of them are quite slow and a little bit romantic, and some of them are very fast uh, and exciting, and some of them are very complicated in the counterpoint of the music. Let me give you some examples. This is number one from book one. is 
a kind of musical style, a compositional style, which has a very strict plan. The structure is, follows very strict rules. In a fugue, we have a single line starting out at the beginning. There's a single strand of melody. We call that the subject of the fugue. The subject, it might be cheerful, it might be sad, it might be loud, it might be quiet. And the subject sets the character of the fugue. Here are some fugues. ทุกเพลงจะต้องตามด้วยฟีลฟีลเป็นลักษณะการประพันธ์รูปแบบการประพันธ์ที่มีความมีความมีความสตรัคเจอร์มีความเป็นโครงสร้างชัดเจนแล
Uh, you know, I was using some pedaling. You heard me using pedaling. You heard me using dynamics. I had crescendos to create intensity. Uh, but we also need to think about the tempo and about the articulation. These are important areas of what we do with rock music. Usually, in the music from this period, if we're playing something quite fast moving, we would separate the quavers. A little bit, not staccato, but just a little bit separate in the articulation. But the semi quavers we would play legato. But if we feel that the character of the music is more expressive when we study the music, we can play more legato because some of Bach's fugues remind us of his fugues for choirs, his choral fugues, like that one there. Very calm. It's very calm. And so when we look at the music, we have to think about what is the expressive character. And once we've decided that, then we can decide how to consider the articulation. So during this period, then the, the harpsichord was uh, fundamentally the most important instrument because uh, it was for the harpsichord that all the solo, the solo music was being written by the composers in the Baroque period. Scarlatti in Italy, Handel in England, Bach in Germany. So several composers from various countries all writing harpsichord music and it was the fundamental instrument. And it was quite interesting because the harpsichord appeared even when the small orchestras were playing. There was always a harpsichord. And the reason for that was quite simply the harpsichord would play the same music as the cello or the double bass. The harpsichord player in the orchestra was only given the bass line and underneath the bass line we had the figures numbers that told the harpsichordist which chords to play with his right hand. That's called a figured bass. And the bass line in Baroque music of this style is called continuo. Continuo is, it means the bass line. So the harpsichord player's left hand and the cello player or the bassoonist or the double bass, they would all play the same music. But the only difference is the harpsichord is would, with his right hand, he would improvise. There was no music written. He just had to look at the figures underneath to work out from the bass note which chord. So a harpsichord is needed to be able to be treble clef, bass clef, and also a figured bass. It was part of their education. <laughs> ก็ที่แอนเดลต้องเขียนคีย์บอร์ดสวิตหรือคีย์บอร์ดโซโล่นะครับนอกจากนั้นฮาร์ดสกอร์ดเป็นเครื่องดนตรีในวงออเคสต
เล่นเบสไลน์แนวเดียวกับพวกเครื่องเบสเชนโลหรือว่าพวกประสูนที่เล่นเสียงต่ำคือซ้ายจะเล่นไปตามไปตามเราเดียวกับเบสนะครับส่วนมือขวาต้องยิบไว้สกอร์ดีฟิเกอร์เบสก็คือมีเลขคอร์ดเขียนไว้ใต้เบสแค่เลขนะครับไม่มีไม่มีไม่มีโน้ตไม่มีอะไรแล้วก็ต้องยิบไว้ใส่คอร์ดไปตามที่ของโมเดลต่างๆเดินเนื่องทำหน้าที่ยุ่งยุ่งหลายอย่าง Another area of interpretation is when we have dotted notes in Baroque period. A dotted quaver and a semi-quaver. Uh, we don't play as a dotted quaver and semi-quaver. Often we play the dotted quaver as a longer note and then a rest. And the quaver we play as a demi-semi-quaver. And I will demonstrate. <laughs> นะครับโน้ตปรับจุดที่มันจะไม่เล่นตามค่าโน้ตที่ปรับจุดนะครับจะได้ฟังครับ So the music is written like this The King of France, King Louis XIV, he built a palace called the Palace of Versailles. It's a beautiful palace, and that's where the music was performed. And he really enjoyed all the very, very beautiful decorations and the architecture, very beautiful mirrors, and with, with lots of carvings and lots of paintings. And he liked his music to be very ornamented. As you probably noticed, they all like to wear very grand clothes, and the music, the French music, was particularly more ornamented than the Italian or the German. The French really liked the music to be highly ornamented. This is the kind of style from which the Inégal comes from France. Uh, style from France, but just a bit more of a music scene, right? ก็สร้างพระราชวังแวร์ซายดนตรีก็เหมือนกันดนตรีสไตล์ฝรั่งเศสก็จะต้องระดับระดาเป็นโน้ตที่หรูหรานะครับมีโน้ตระดับเยอะแยะมากกว่าไซเบรียกับเยอรมันด้วยเ
improvise that. <laughs> it's just so ridiculously ornamented. It's like a wedding cake. You know, it's just very, very got too much decoration. It's too much, too much. No. But that is, if you hear that style of music on a harpsichord, you can instantly say French Baroque. And so people say, why? Because of the, the, the dotting and because of also the highly ornamented uh, musical style. So, if we go to the final uh, one with the composers, yep. So we have, I think, four names that we definitely would recognize from the period. Johann Sebastian Bach, of course. Handel, we talked about. Scarlatti, uh, he was the Italian. Scarlatti lived his life in Italy. Interestingly, Handel was born in Germany. And when Handel was a boy, when he was a small boy, he really wanted to be a musician. And his father said, no. No, no, no. Musicians do not enjoy a happy life. Musicians will be poor. A musician will be a servant. So, uh, so no, no, no. No, you must study languages and you must study law and become a lawyer. Then you have respect in the society. You will have a lot of respect and you will have more money and you can have a happy life. Well, George Handel was a very polite boy, very obedient. So he studied hard, and by the age of 21, he could speak four languages very, very well. He could speak four languages very well indeed, and he studied and he, became, he got a degree in law. But then after that, he thought, okay, I did what my father wanted. But then I think his father passed away, so Handel said, now I do music. So he went to Italy. So although he was born in Germany, he went to Italy and everybody liked him very much. But there was a bad feeling between Handel and Scarlatti because Scarlatti was always the most famous. And so they had a competition, public competition to see who was the best. And they tried to settle it by saying Scarlatti was the best harpsichordist, but Handel was the best organist. They had to find a way to get a good solution so, and then Handel came, after he learned music in Italy, he came to live in London and he composed all his important music in London. So Handel was very cosmopolitan and traveled. He was born in Germany, he studied music in Italy, but he worked as a musician in England. So he was the most cosmopolitan. So look at that, Handel was a cosmopolitan man. อยู่ได้หลายทวีปหลายประเทศนะครับสรุปว่าเป็นเกิดที่เยอรมนีนะแต่ว่าต้องการเรียนทางด้านดนตรีแต่พ่อไม่ให้นะครับต้องเรียนกับเรียนอาร์ตแล้วก็มีความเฟื่องฟูผู้เรียนหลายภาษาแต่สุดท้ายของพ่อเสียชีวิตก็หาหน้าเรียนจบทุกอย่างปั๊บก็สนใจดนตรีนะครับมีการแข่งขันย้ายไปที่อิตาลีนะครับมีเจอสกาลาตีสกาลาตีนะครับสิบหกใช่ไหมครับสกาลาตีไม่ชอบที่ยาเท่าไหร่ฉันเก่งอยู่คนเดียวมีก็มาแข่งขันกันสรุปว่าแฮนเดลเก่งออกแกงกว่าครับสกอตสกาลาตีได้ปสุดท้ายก็กลับไปใช้ชีวิตเขียนเพลงให้เจ้าจอร์จไปที่อังกฤษในตลอดชีวิตนะครับก็เลยเป็นคอสโมโพลิเทนแดงนะครับย้ายมาตั้งถิ่นฐานไปที่เองครับ and the last one Vivaldi we we think about Vivaldi today as a composer of uh, Italian style concertos a concerto in three movements for violin and orchestra and harpsichord or maybe flute or oboe and his most famous concertos are called the Seasons, the Four Seasons. So Vivaldi, not so much as an harpsichord composer, but a very, very important Baroque composer. And uh, he, he is remembered today for his concertos. And for Vivaldi, he did not work so much for a king or a duke. Uh, what Vivaldi did was, he composed his music for a, a school, which was for orphan girls orphans so these girls had no family but the church the church took care of these girls they went to a school for orphan girls and they were trained in music and all of the valley's music was performed by the girls so all the music of the valley we hear today originally played by these 
girls. So in some ways these girls had a very unfortunate life, but in some ways a very fortunate life. They were the first ones to, to, to have the musical skills to play Vivaldi's music. So he was another of the great Italian Okay, so some of the things we touched upon uh, already. Um, already, so next one, please. There are four people in the 20th century that I just would like to mention as being great authorities on Bach. This is the final bit we're coming to the last bit of education. Rosalind Turek, Glenn Gould, Wanda Landowska, and Karl Richter. Rosalind Turek uh, published uh, a series of books, three volumes, on the music of Bach in 1960. She's a very, she was a very, very important uh, authority on Bach's music. So you can find her on the internet and you'll find a lot of stuff by Rosalind Turek, a lot, to help you to understand how to play your ornaments in Bach and things like your touch for Bach. Rosalind Turek? And then the next one, Glenn Gould, he's not remembered from what he wrote, but he's remembered, he was a Canadian pianist, and he's remembered for his recordings. And you can also find videos of him on YouTube as well. And this was lots of Bach, you know, lots of Bach. Uh, and his most famous recordings are the Goldberg variations of Bach. So Glenn Gould is another person who plays Bach with great authority. Um, and you can learn a lot just by watching him and listening to him and looking at his interesting technique. He's a Canadian, so he's what I would recommend. But he's often the Glenn Gould, the topic Canadian. And then the third one, a lady called Wanda Landowska, she was a Polish lady, she came from Poland, but she lived in, she, she studied in Berlin, there's a lot to write here, she, she's from Poland, she studied in Berlin, and she came to live in France. And she opened her house in France to be a center for early music. And she had harpsichords and other instruments. And in the 1930s, 1937, she came to live in America. And she really revitalized, she brought to life the harpsichord. Americans have never really known anything about the harpsichord. But this lady, she gave harpsichord recitals for many years in America, even in places like Wigmore Hall. And she herself uh, used to say the funny story when people say, I like to play my Bach like this. And she said, you play Bach your way, and I will play Bach his way. <laughs> you know, she felt she really knew, knew what she was talking about. Uh, she would say to people, I really think this is the way to play Bach. And, and she was very convincing. And again, very, very old footage on YouTube. It's a very old lady, you know, this is an old film playing the harpsichord. You know, fantastic, fantastic harpsichordist. And you will see her touch very curved fingers, which is very suitable for Bach. Randa Landowska. เป็นโพลิชนะครับเป็นโปแลนด์แล้วก็เป็นเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอฟเอ
ครับเป็นเรื่องทางสิทธิ์ของศึกษานะครับแล้วก็มีความเชื่อมั่นในการเล่นบาสในสไตล์ตัวเองมากไม่สนแฟนซีอยู่เล่นผมอยู่ไปฉันจะเล่นสไตล์ฉันผู้หญิงมีความมั่นใจในการเล่นในบาสสปอร์ตเองเล่นบาสสปอร์ตเองกับมีชีวิตทำให้คนรู้จักมากขึ้นในประเทศอังกฤษ And the last one is the man called Karl Richter Karl Richter and he he was a German um, he um, was a fantastic man because in the 20th century he graduated in music and then he, he lived in Leipzig which was the city where Bach had lived he played the organ in the church that Bach had played at St. Thomas's church but the amazing thing about Karl Richter is he devoted his life to Bach's music and he could play all Bach's keyboard music by memory all of it by memory not only his piano music but his organ music and he could conduct all the great choral works by memory. Unbelievable man, Karl Richter. And when he was becoming a little bit older and he was losing his eyesight, he said, I have to memorize more music. But I mean, I, can, I have a little memory, but this man was a giant of musical memory, a giant of musical memory. And you can find him on, you will find lots of recordings by Karl Richter and very, very no-nonsense. He just plays with great authority. And I recommend Carl Richter to do also. So that's just a list of some you can you can take pictures if you like. That's just a list of some of the some of the uh, pieces from the period, you know, for keyboard. Well, what we're going to do now is we're going to have a very short break because uh, we've finished with you know, this now and the up and. You've been such good listeners, you're very patient listening. I thought some of you might fall asleep when you're talking for so long. But then we'll have a short break, five minutes, just a five minute break for convenience. And then come back and I'm going to tell you about what I'm planning to do in January next year. Um, uh, a course I'm hoping to start uh, in, in Thailand. I'm already running in Hong Kong and uh, China and Malaysia. So. I'll come, I'll tell you about it, we will take a 10 minute break, so next one please. The end! Thank you very much.